Everybody, welcome to Two Zero Q. Twenty questions with interesting people, where we learn the origin stories of everyday superheroes in the LGBT community and friends. I am your host, the very handsome Tim Kirk, and our guest this time is rock on tour, bon vivant, man about town, Jerry Posnack. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Tim. It's so nice to be here. What a fabulous uh, uh, setup there, man. I've never been called a bon vivant, so I love it. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, and I'm going to start, as I always do, with uh, my first question, a bit about your background. Where are you originally from, and what was it like? Well, born and raised right here in New York City, uh, outside of this. Well, you know, those of us were born in New York City, even though, you know, they considered the city Manhattan. So, you know, if you're born and raised New Yorker and you say you're from the city, it's from Manhattan. So I was born outside of the city in the borough of Queens. It was an interesting upbringing. It was, uh, you know, I mean, it was definitely a very urban slash suburban type environment. You know, I lived in a three story walk up. You know, my mom and dad rented an apartment for their whole lives, just about, you know, um, nothing opulent, you know, ran around the neighborhood as a kid, you know, playing games literally in the street, you know, trying to dodge cars whenever possible, playing games like Scully and Kick the Can and Stoop Ball, which are iconic New York City street games when you don't really have a park to play it, even though we weren't too far from what is now known as Flushing Meadow Corona Park. But at the time, for us, it was the old World's Fair grounds. So interesting, you know, it was sort of a little bit of a rough upbringing to a certain degree. I mean, fighting was uh, the norm, meaning if you didn't like somebody, you know, you'd punch them. So, you know, it was uh, uh, definitely not not like it is now. You street kid, you. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, which life experience had the greatest impact on you? Having kids really was the greatest thing. You know, one thing was, well, you know, I'm married more than once. Um, when I was married to my first wife, we always spoke about not having children. And then when I married Lisa, um, you know, she very much wanted children. And I got to tell you, uh, going from no children to children definitely completely changes your life. I mean, so that was the biggest change, uh, you know, raising these little mortals, you know, you know, they come home with you, you know, and, and Zach, my son, when he was born, you know, he had some issues. He was in uh, neonatal intensive care for a few weeks when he was first born. And, you know, that's that's kind of rough. But so, yeah, the biggest the biggest change for me was definitely having and raising kids and, and being on along for the ride. In fact, I am b fortunate because I still get to w see my kids on a regular basis. Zach, Zach's my right hand man in um, the business. And uh, Alex, uh, our daughter, you know, still, you know, is got her hand. She works for us a couple of days a week. In fact, you know, both of them saw both of them today. That's pretty cool. Zach's six two, you know, so whenever I introduce him to a client, you know, or if they don't know him, I said, you know, you know, Zach's, you know, much taller, much taller and, more, and much more handsome than I am. So uh, it's a great introduction. And I said, it's so nice to see them both grow into such incredible adults and and to see where their focus is. So um, that to me is, you know, I'm so proud of them every day. I mean, Zach has been killing it on social media with uh, uh, his videos that he does on, on on cleaning and laundry tips. And Alex has found her niche in the creative world. So it's it's very I'm very fortunate. So uh, what would you say to anyone interested in an aspect of your experience, meaning if someone wanted to explore an idea or a perspective opportunity based on what you can tell them, what would be the main thing to encourage or discourage them? There, there are not many ideas that are too crazy to pursue. I mean, you know, you've got, you know, in business, for example, you know, you've got, you know, your standard ideas to expand your business or to grow your business or to improve your business. And you have the ones that are slightly aspirational. Then you have your blue sky, you know, or your pie in the sky ones. You know what? And you should always try for the pie in the sky ones. Um, you never know what's going to happen and what what's going to what's going to work and what's not going to work. And sometimes the crazy eyes, the crazier the idea, the better off you're going to be because it may just have that little niche. I mean, the same is true with negotiating. If you're negotiating with somebody, you should have that negotiation set up so that you do have an uh, an aspirational get 
which is beyond what you would really would want to settle for because you need to be able to push towards that in order to, to retract back to get what you want. But you, no idea is too crazy because you never know. You, you never know what's going to work. You know, I just happened to be reading a negotiation, uh, a little, little little blueprint, and one of the things that they said is always go for the get that you don't want to get because then then you have leverage to to say no to other things and then get what get other things you really want. You know, oh, uh, so, you know, it's 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 absolutely right, and you know, um, I I was in this Goldman Sachs program. Uh, and one of it was, you know, they taught us negotiations and they had this wonderful woman uh, named Maura from uh, the Wharton School. And, you know, she really taught us negotiations in a way that it almost felt like therapy. And that, you know, you really need to uh, understand who you're negotiating with and you have to negotiate with facts. You know, you can't negotiate with feelings, you know, because you're not going to win on a negotiation like that, especially if somebody who is a good negotiator, because they're going to say, you know, what is, you feel that this price is too high. You know, it's not black and white. So, uh, yeah. And I said, you never. And then with ideas, I mean, you know, with with working with with Zach, you know, some of the ideas that he had for, for doing videos, which I thought were a little out there, are the ones that are working the best. You know, he, he, he decided we wanted to create, you know, how to videos on dry cleaning and stains sort of in the vein originally his originally his his thought originally was to do them in the way that that uh, online chef Babish does his videos where you kind of just see hands and sort of recipes, you know, and it worked, but it wasn't it didn't really flow. I and mean, then when he started putting himself in front of the camera and talking about things which I thought were incredibly mundane, like um care labels or how to sort your laundry or why you shouldn't use fabric softener. There's such an appetite for this because I feel that so many people just don't, no one ever taught them how to do laundry. No one ever taught them how to take care of their clothes. So for him to come up with these whole, this whole video series, which I was like, eh, and it's working. And there's an idea that was, I thought was a little out there, which is, has so much legs and you know, seeing him have videos that have been seen by, you know, 4 million people to me is yeah. crazy. That's wild. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to say, what was your, or what is, or what was your most noteworthy achievement? Well, I mean, uh, again, personal achievement were for kids and raising them and, you know, spending a ton of time with them growing up and, you know, you know, one thing that I, um, from my upbringing was that, you know, my dad wasn't around to uh, sort of expose me to the world. So my, my uncle Phil took me everywhere. And I kind of learned from him the importance of exposing kids to as much as possible as an early age, whether it be, you know, museums and art and culture and different foods, so that they wouldn't become closed minded. And I think that knowing that in advance and 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 sticking to that and you know allowing them to do exploration and to expose them to as much as possible created little very well rounded individuals who you know see the world with an incredible worldview and are not you know you know not closed minded i mean i saw so many of my kids friends growing up you know, I mean, it was like impossible when they would come over for dinner, you know, they would only eat chicken you know, or chicken nuggets or like, you know, have this really narrow palate because they weren't exposed to it. You know, and I think my biggest achievement in business was when Lisa, my wife, uh, you know, kind of told me when I had an opportunity to um, take over the running and stewardship of Jeeves was to, to make that change, to do Jeeves and not be complacent and stay with my prior business, which was a family business, Cameo Cleaners. So, you know, she sort of pushed me and said, you know what, you need a change, you need to do something different. And if I didn't do that, I would not have experienced what I experienced over the last 14 years because of being an international brand. It afforded me uh, travel, you know, uh, you know, to Far East Asia a few times and to do these incredible shows at the time, fashion shows all over the world which if I would have stayed in the family business, I never would have done that. So those are, those are two things, you know, I, I don't want to just focus on business only, but yeah, those two accomplishments are, are amazing. 
it's pretty, uh, pretty substantial, I must say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so based on that, uh, the biggest personal challenge you have faced, personal injury, a seemingly overwhelming task, a personal or professional goal, a difficult situation you had to overcome? Professional goal has been, you know, there was a time in, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty during, like, especially now here during, during this pandemic, you know, I mean, trying to navigate uh, a business of our size when you're seeing 80% revenue drop, um, you know, the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, staying, keeping your doors open so that you could help the clients who did remain in the city was a challenge. Um, you know, being very um, <clears throat> proactive right away with, you know, applying for as many grants and, you know, payroll protection program uh, as quickly as possible really got us through the pandemic. But I got to be honest, Tim, you know, I've been, been seeing a lot of shit in New York City when it comes to business and being here, you know, 9-11, um, multiple, you know, uh, financial meltdowns, you know, 2008 recessions before that, you know, the big giant blackout. Uh, whatever, don't remember what year that was when we lost power in New York City, when the whole, you know, northeast east grid went down for like three or four days, you know, but nothing like this, nothing, you know, I've always been weathering the storm, waiting for the next shoe to drop economically, because it happens in, in you know, it's, it happens in waves. But, you know, I was always waiting for that 20 percent, 30 percent, you know, financial meltdown where you lose that much business. But I never, never in my life would I ever think that we would. Like, I mean, nothing. I mean, 80% down, you know, doing 20% of what you normally did and then trying to keep uh, the lights on and the rent paid and not lay off anyone. So I was happy we didn't lay off anybody, you know, and when we came out of the pandemic, we rehired everybody. Nobody, nobody, there wasn't any staff member who didn't work for us either full or part time throughout the whole pandemic. You know, we kept our entire staff and we only lost one staff member who left on his own when the pandemic ended. Well, it didn't really end, but when we swimming, but went back to, uh, you know, a more somewhat normal life. So, it's funny. Um, both, uh, we're friends with people at La Boite en Bois and Chelsea Ristorante and the mm -hmm. veterans we've spoken to, uh, both, we ask them how things are going, they go, you know, the, the shrug because they're, they're not back to the pre-pandemic. Uh, um, normals because a lot of it has to do with there's nobody there still aren't enough people that hang out after work right and uh, people coming in from out of town you know so yeah, like they, so they the need that gone. i know thankfully we, we don't rely on tourists but you know i mean I, I you know my my laundered shirt you know gentlemen's gentlemen's dress shirts is a fraction of what it used to be we were smart enough to pivot to do more interior cleaning you know draperies and um sofas and area rugs and stuff like that but you know, that kind of helped us a lot. But, you know, there was right up until actually September. September was the first month that we had. September of this year was the first month that we had, which we were very close to our numbers from 2019. And that's, I mean, I'm sure that's because people went back to work. People went back to work. And then also, you know, because of the type of clientele that we have, you know, they're going back to doing things. The galas have happened again. Yeah. You know. There's some red carpet events. They're doing, you know, parties again, weddings, a lot of weddings. I mean, we've seen so many wedding dresses. I mean, it's like wedding dresses are, are flying in for cleaning because everyone, you know, was, you know, not getting married or they yeah. had maybe small private, you know, ceremonies and now they're having the big affair. So, I mean, if I don't, if I get five or six inquiries a day about wedding dress cleaning, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I've never seen that much concentration of, of certain aspects of our business ever before so i'm hoping that we get through all of this um you know i mean on a personal level uh, you know the biggest challenge you know uh, i am our daughter alex um you know you know in her in her early um 20s you know had some um mental health issues which were extraordinarily challenging for my wife and i and then, you know it it took a, a a big it took a tremendous toll on us personally it took a toll on our marriage um you know, when you see anyone suffer with with any sort of mental illness, it's it's difficult. And, you know, the resources just aren't out there for it. It's it's not seen as the same as if you break a leg or break an arm. You know, you know, people sympathize with you on those kind of situations. But when you, you know, tell someone about someone who has mental illness, 
you know, it's, it's, it's looked at completely differently. And, yeah. you know, that was a challenge because, you know, neither of us have had to deal with this before. And, um, you know, we didn't know if we were doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And I mean, thankfully at this point, you know, Alex is in a, a, a great place and, you know, and over the last, and it's taken this, this long up, I would say up until this year, I, I mean, I've never seen Alex happier until this year. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, it is great. But that was a tremendous, that was a tremendous personal challenge. I can, I, I can absolutely see that. So um, now that we've understood what you're going through, what drives you? What gets you up in the morning? Uh, I love a challenge and I love to accomplish things. I'm very much, um, I'd like to always finish something that I start. So, I mean, getting up in the morning, I'm a, you know, a, a, as I've gotten older, I have realized the value of, of exercise. I mean, so, I mean, I mean, physically what gets me up in the morning is knowing that I need to go work out because I'm not one of those people who really enjoys working out. I mean, there are those people who go to the gym who love it. You know, I do it begrudgingly, but I, I'm trying to stave off dementia because both of my parents passed away from dementia. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to keep ahead of that curve. So I, I, I go out and do that. But honestly, what drives me is the challenge of navigating through the day because I, it, as a small business person, you never know what you are going to get hit with. You never know what your day is going to bring you. You may, I may have a list in the morning. I want to accomplish X, Y, and Z. And then, you know, there's a quote, you know, there's a quote by Mike, T Mike, by Mike Tyson. It's, uh, and he said, you know, everyone has a plan until you, someone punches you in the face. Yeah. So it's kind of like that. You know, I come to work the other day and I just want to get these three things done. And, you know, next thing you know is I'm on the phone with a customer who has an issue or who doesn't show for work and who has their own personal issue. Because when you are in a small business, that doesn't have HR, you know, I don't have a Toby like from the office that I can, you know, call up to help me. I'm HR or Zach's HR. And, you know, you know, when you're around the same group of people, I mean, we, we employ about 19 people, you know, I, I see these, these 19 people more than I do, uh, you know, my family sometimes. So, you know, you get to see a lot of their problems and what they're going through. And a lot of that spills out and, you know, so you never know what's going to get through the day. So what gets me going through the day is, is the, is the, not the fear of the unknown, but the, the challenge of the unknown. And then, you know, how are we going to rise to the occasion to get to the end goal? And for us, it's all about keeping our clients happy. You know, in, in the business that I'm in as a luxury dry cleaner, we're not selling a product, you know, we're not selling, um, you know, iPhones or dresses or anything else. You know, we're selling our clients clothes back to them in better condition than they gave them to us and you know i would like to say in new like condition and that's what we're that's what we're trying for we're trying to return their clothes back to them and giving them a new like garment experience and that could be a challenge because a lot of people you know who i work with our clients are fantastically wealthy so that the problems that you or i may face during the day you know either monetarily our financial problems or or any sort of problems you know, when you're, when some of our clients are billionaires, you know, I mean, the finance, financial problems don't exist. So small little things may be a bigger problem for them than for you or I, like the placement, you know, a slightly incorrect placement of a button on a Chanel jacket may be very, may be very difficult for them to handle where for someone like you or I, eh, we'll get through it. You know, it's yeah. a little askew. I'll go to dinner, you know? You know, rather than saying, you know, I can't go to lunch with my friends because they're going to notice my Chanel button is crooked and it's the end of, end of you know, end of the world for me. So, so that's the challenge. It's, a, it's, it's, you never know. It's, I said, you never know it's, if someone's going to punch you in the face on any given day. So based on that, what is your Zen? My Zen is flying my airplane. That is my Zen. Uh, 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 honestly, I, that is the best form of therapy for myself. You know, um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an airline pilot and because I have a, a hearing issue that, um, didn't happen. 
So in, 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 instead of that, you know, uh, about 15 years ago, I finally got my pilot's license. And I got to tell you, when I'm flying my airplane, I can't think of anything else. So for me, that is the best form of therapy or meditation because I'm completely engrossed in what I'm doing when I'm, you know, in the cockpit, you know, piloting this, this little two seater airplane and don't, you know, I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. It's not like, it's not like succession. I'm not flying a jet across the, the sea to Croatia to dodge the, uh, you know, uh, to dodge the government. I'm, um, you know, I'm, I got a small little two seater that I just do that to kind of like poke holes in the clouds. So th- my last of my 10 questions is called the threshold. And that the is threshold. the threshold is the point of no turning back. The wall has been built up behind the door. You just walk through. There is nothing there now. You can't go back. Uh, happens to everybody at one point in their life. You know, there's no turning back. You, you can't even think about it anymore. Uh, how did you know when you arrived there? How did it feel to cross it? And what was the significance to you? What did you leave behind? What are you glad you left behind? And what do you regret leaving behind? Well, the threshold for me was for many years, I wanted to get out of the dry cleaning business. You know, I started with my my parents. I started working with my dad in the, the late 80s. Um, it was supposed to be a temporary gig just to help him out while he was having some um, business issues. He had, a, you know, got rid of his partner. So I never really envisioned myself being a dry cleaner per se, you know, and then, you know, you kind of stay with it. You know, it, the money was better than I was making because I went to uh, the School of Visual Arts and, you know, I graduated with a degree in photography and I was an assistant studio manager, et cetera. But, you know, you know, you don't make a whole lot of money in that, you know, and then I got married too young, way too young first time around. And, you know, the money was better, was double, more than double what I was making as an assistant. You know, and I always had a thought of getting out, you know, in the when when Zachary was born in 1993, I actually was going to the French Culinary Institute and to study because I really wanted to get into the restaurant business. And then, you know, after Zach was born, I realized that, you know, if I did that, I probably would never see him on any sort of significant time, you know, and I was glad I didn't do that. Um, You know, I guess after Zach was born and then Alexandra was born and then, you know, I really knew that I had to um, be financially responsible to them and to Lisa uh, at that point that I realized that, you know, that was the time to um, not sort of try to get out of the business, even though I always thought about it. But I really think that that wall grew when I when I took over Jeeves because it was such a great opportunity to to take this brand, which at the time, the prior owner sort of had driven into the ground, where at one point, Jeeves was the only and the the luxury dry cleaner in New York City. And it had been, you know, sort of surpassed by other dry cleaners who were doing a much better job than we were. And I guess, you know, that wall started slowly building when I started to really improve what was going on here, you know, and then, you know, ultimately before the pandemic you know almost quadrupling revenue from when when i purchased it which in a a industry in the dry cleaning business most dry cleaners are seeing a retraction of business not an increase so i mean that's when the wall i the regrets that i have were you know i would have it would have been nice at some point to do something else you know, I mean, the regret that I have is always being a small business owner is that I have never experienced work friends. You know, I've never had people who uh, I've gone out with after work who, you know, co-workers because everyone has always worked for me or, as I say now, works with me, but they're staff. So I don't, you know, really hang out with staff after work. So, I mean, that's a regret not knowing that. Do I miss never going and doing a corporate job? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, small being a small business owner has a lot of advantages, but also a lot of disadvantages. You know, you're at the mercy of your staff. You're at the mercy of your client's whim. You know, you don't you may not have as much flexibility sometimes if you work for, a, a, you know, a, a real company where you get a set number of days off or it's not a problem. You know, you get that call late at night or early in the morning if someone's not going to get to work. So 
but that's the wall that I built. The wall I built was the wall of dry cleaning. So I never really thought I was going to stay in the industry and I don't regret it. I mean, there are days that, you know, I may say, you know, what did I do? You know, I'm, I'm, I just turned 60 this year. So, I mean, there's really no going back at that point, at this point. Uh, but I said, it's been an interesting ride to say the least, you know, uh, the, the, the places I've seen, the crazy things that I've cleaned, you know, I mean, from the costumes for the Metropolitan Opera House for five years to this giant fabric mural in Lincoln Center that's 30 feet tall and 90 feet wide, and we've cleaned it twice. I mean, you know, there are things that, you know, I never thought, you know, we took care of the entire uh costumes when they uh, they brought the costumes over for the Downton Abbey ex exhibition that was on 57th Street a few years ago you know they wow. all came in and they were all full of mold really? and you know yeah they didn't know what happened well they knew what happened but they the show was due to open like in a month and they opened up all these shipping crates because the show had been sh shipped over from I think Singapore if I'm not mistaken they did like a test run of the show in Singapore. They built it there. The whole show was built in Singapore, I guess, to save money. They created everything. And then when the costumes, and these are the actual costumes that were worn on the show. A lot of the, all the women's stuff was all vintage or vintage, you know, re, re, you know, not, you know, vintage fabrics or, you know, sort of Frankenstein things where they put things together, but they're absolutely exquisite. And then they opened up these shipping crates and everything was covered in this, you know, gray, hairy mold because I guess, they were told that the, the hold of the ship was going to be climate controlled and it wasn't. Oh. So it was for them a nightmare. For me, it was a great opportunity to show them what I can do. And, and in the end, you know, we were able to get all the mold off of everything. Literally, I, I spent two weeks in the basement of where the exhibit was going to happen, hand cleaning everything personally. And they were ecstatic. And I was so happy I got to meet the costume designer. She flew in from England. You know, she was a nervous wreck because they didn't know what they were going to do if they weren't able to put these things, all, all these costumes, which were the, the main part of the exhibit. I mean, everybody wanted to see the, the wedding dresses that the, the girls wore and, you know, some of the other clothes. I mean, you know, and it would have been a disaster otherwise. Wow. Hope that answers your question. I, I kind of sure. went on a tangent there. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I understand you also have a recent experience, which is uh, somewhat um, uh, compelling. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Zach and I went down to Atlanta to, to take a class in leather cleaning and restoration. So we were flying back. Um, we had like a 130 flight out of Atlanta, it's supposed to go direct into LaGuardia Airport here in New York City. So, you know, we get to the airport, we get there early, and um, get on the plane, you know, do the pushback, get to the runway, hanging out there for a while. And, you know, me being a pilot, I know we're, we're sitting there a little bit too long at the runway. Finally, pilot gets on the, the intercom, you know, uh, you know, we, we can't get clearance to take off because um, air traffic control is not accepting any more traffic into the Washington, D.C. area. Well, there seemed to be a line of storms uh, from Jacksonville, Florida, all the way up the coast running north to south, all the way up through the New York region. Yes, and what was odd was the weather pattern was normally our weather goes from west to east. This time, the, the weather pattern was going from south to north. So all the weather was kept coming and coming right over New York City. So he says, uh, well, you know, we're going to sit here for a while and see if we can get clearance. Well, an hour goes by, he gets back on the intercom and says, you know, it's a no-go. We're going back to the gate because now we can't get clearance through. I guess they were going to try to route us through the Ohio Valley region. So he said, now we can't get, you know, clearance through uh, Ohio ATC. Fun. Go back at the airport. Now it's like 2.30. We're sitting there. They keep delaying the flight. They keep delaying the flight. They keep delaying the flight. Finally, they load us back on the plane. I think it was around eight o'clock, load us back on the plane, eight o'clock. Um, we're sitting there, close the, the main cabin door, waiting for the pushback, no pushback, waiting, 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 waiting. The captain gets on the intercom again. Um, well, we had an opportunity to leave, but we timed out. That means that the pilots had been on duty for too long. They couldn't fly under FAA regulations. So it's like, 8.30 now, and they unload the plane. It's 9 o'clock, and they're thinking of getting another crew. And finally, they close. They, they cancel our flight. It's 11 p.m. We're in Atlanta. Now, we'd been at the airport probably from 11.30 in the morning because we got there super early. 
And now it's like we're in the airport now, almost 12 hours later. All right. So people are swarming all over the place. You know, they're saying you got to go see Delta customer service. They'll get you a flight back home. So we go to the Delta customer service line and there's like one agent on duty. It's 11 o'clock at night now. It's 11 o'clock oh, at yeah, night. They right. finally cancel. It's 11 o'clock at night. And they, they all go off duty at midnight. So there's one person and it's literally Tim, about 125 people online. I'm thinking oh, this, ain't, this is not going to go well. So I run back to the gate and I asked somebody there, I said, look, what should we do? There's, he says, well, I, what I would do is try the other terminals because in Atlanta, there's multiple terminals. So he goes, I would try, try terminal one or terminal three. So Zach and I are like running. Zach goes to terminal one. I go to terminal three. We finally find a, an agent who can help us with his no line. They're absolutely useless. I mean, I mean, I don't know if it was just the situation. So Delta offers us a flight the next day. The only flight they have the next day is a 3 p.m. flight to Albany. I'm like, where am I going to do in Albany? Or we can wait. Now, this is Thursday night or that's Friday, right? And we both have to get back to work. Or we can go Saturday or Sunday back to LaGuardia. I'm like, I don't really want to hang out here. So Zach's on his laptop and he find, and we're, we're asking the Delta agent, well, can, you, can, can we go to another airport in the area? Is there another airport that we could fly out of? We can't do that. We can only book you out of this. We have to call customer service, pick up the customer service line. They're like, it's a two hour wait to talk to customer service agent. So Zach's on his laptop and he, he finds a Spirit Air, a Spirit Air flight 6 a.m. the next morning from Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, come on. Nashville, Tennessee to Atlanta, it's a four hour drive. All right, so it's 11.15 now. I say, Zach, book it, right? Now we gotta get from the Delta terminal to rent a car. I figured, ah, we get to rent a car. I'm sure we can rent a car. We'll drive to Nashville, no big deal, right? So to get, to get there, you've got to take a tram to the baggage carousel area. And from the baggage carousel area, you got to take another train to the rent-a-car center, which is like outside of the airport grounds. And all the, the rent-a-car places close at midnight. So we're, again, we're running through the airport. We get on the tram. We get there. We get there. It's 1145. There's six rent-a-car companies that are still open. Not one rental car company had a car for us. So now it's midnight and we have a 6 a.m. flight in Nashville and we paid for them. And we're like, what are we gonna do? All right, so I, Zach, Zach sits down, he's completely dejected at this point and he's exhausted. And, and I'm like, okay, we have one more thing we can do. So get on the old iPhone and let's try a lift. First Lyft driver, we, we, we book it and it's like a fortune. It's like $450. I'm like, we'll figure it out. Guy comes, says, uh, we said, you know, he looks at finally, you know, they don't really know their destination until you pick up the passenger. So before he gets there, we call him and say, look, this is what we want to do. He says, absolutely not. I said, okay, one more time. Let's try it. Let's roll the dice one more time. So we, we hit it. Lyft drivers comes. Guy opens the back, we're putting our luggage in, and we say to him, Look, do you want to do this? You know, do you want to do this because it's a long drive? You know, and he says, I got to do what I got to do. So it was this wonderful Liberian guy named James. I wish I could find him. Uh, he says, Look, but I'm tired. He goes, I've worked all day and I got to go to work tomorrow, and I'm kind of tired. I said, Look, we'll make you a deal. We have to get there. We don't want to die because you're tired. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying in my head. I don't want this guy to fall asleep while he's driving. I said, "Look, if you're really tired, you pull over. We'll take over the driving duties." So James drives the first hour, and now we're driving through, you know, uh, uh, Georgia, and we hit the Tennessee border, and he pulls over. It's about an hour into the ride, and uh, I take over for an hour. And, oh and and then so I got to fulfill a couple of things on my bucket list. I've, I've now I got to be a Lyft driver, um, actually Lyft and an Uber driver because he had both lights in his window. And I got to see Tennessee at night. Um, so we're driving through Tennessee and it's it's not straight. It's going through the mountains and it's it's curvy. It's windy. It's it's like it definitely will keep you awake. So I we pull over to get fuel. Zach um, takes over. We get 
we're exhausted. We pull into uh, the airport in Nashville. It's 3 a.m. because it's an hour behind. It's central time now. So we gained an hour and our flight 6 a.m. So another first is we get to an airport and TSA isn't open. So we get to see TSA open. We get to see all these guys and women come to work and they're all like, you know, this is one super happy guy, you know, that that guy who you either love or hate, you know, like, hey, Jim, so nice to see you. Isn't a great morning. And this guy's like, and you know, <laughs> he's greeting everyone by name. He's like super happy. It's like 3.30 in the morning, you know, oh, yeah. open up. So we got to be the first people through TSA in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so we're waiting for our Spirit Air flight to go and we, you know, First of all, spirit is insane. It's like, it's basically a, the amenities of a New York City bus in a plane. Really? Yeah, really? well, it's these hard shell seats with minimal padding. They don't recline at all. There's no, there's no screens in front of you. You're getting basically a seat in a metal tube and that's about it. That doesn't wow. move or anything. There is no adjustments here. And literally anything you want to get for Spirit Air is a la carte. You know, they advertise these $70 fares because they won't even let you bring a carry-on for 70 bucks. If you want to bring a carry-on, it's another 70 bucks. I mean, that's how they get you. It's kind of like those dollar bus rides. So we get on the plane and it's, like, it's you know, we, you know, we get on the plane and we're ready to go. And, you know, I see some, you know, they're talking in the cockpit and I know this is not good. And maintenance and all of a sudden the pilot comes on. I'm like, no, please, please, no. Um, uh, this is your captain speaking, and uh, we've got a little maintenance issue here we're working on. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, thankfully, Tim, after about an hour of fiddling with the water supply, and I guess something was clogged in the plumbing. It was a plumbing issue. They finally, we took off an hour late. But that also meant when we got, finally, when we were flying now, instead of going back to LaGuardia, we're flying back into Newark. So... Flying back to Newark, we left an hour late. So by the time we got to Newark, when we landed, there wasn't a gate for us. We had to wait another half an hour. So long story <laughs> short, I was up for over 30 hours straight, got to go th sit on a Delta plane twice, get asked to take, be removed from the Delta plane twice, you know, get have to cut the disembark twice, you know, be told no by six rental car agencies that they had to rent a car, finally coerce a Lyft driver who... We also tipped him a hundred bucks because I think this guy went over and above. I mean, it's it was like 230 miles. <laughs> you know, I mean, I really felt bad for the guy because now, I mean, I only made a good amount of money. I mean, I don't know how much Lyft takes of that, you know, how much he gets, but it, I, I mean, I really got to say he went over and above to take to drive us there. But that was the only way we were able to get home. I mean, it was either that or we're going to be or we're going to be stuck in Atlanta until Saturday or Sunday. My brother drove uh, Uber, and he actually drove a guy to Boston. Yeah, because he yeah. and he became very friendly with the guy, but the guy had his circumstances prevented him from getting on a plane or whatever it was. Right. And he took, and he paid my brother, and he, you know he paid the premium. Yeah. So you know, this things happen. Yeah, no, I said I was really we were we were lucky. I mean, to a certain degree, that we were able to get this uh, this. this wonderful man named james from from you know mem from uh you know atlanta georgia who who stepped up to the plate and you know i mean i mean that was it if he said no we were just gonna you know find a hotel and then you know figure out what we're gonna do so uh, you know it was definitely the adventure it was something i'll never forget and it's something well uh, i would like to forget as well okay i'm gonna go a little bit easier then on you all right what What's the first thing you want to come to people's minds when they think of you? Integrity. You know, that well, everything that I've done in my life has been with integrity. Um, you know, I feel really strongly about that. You know, I, 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 I'm in, in this business, you know, that's all I have is trust. And uh, I, I've tried to always be, you know, that kind of a person, you know, to, you know, I'm, I, I've always want people to know that I, I stand by my word. You know, if I'm going to say I'm going to get something done, it's going to get done. And if I say I'm going to do something with you, it's going to happen. You know, that I'm not I don't I'm not someone who lets people down. So, I mean, I think that's one of my best characteristics is integrity. 
I uh, tend to hopefully think that that's me too. I think I always say I'm the real deal. You know, I yeah. honestly, if I say I'm going to do something, I do it, and, and I don't care if I'm good or bad at it. You know, I, 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 I'm much more concerned with actually committing and and executing and having being able to say, look myself in the eye, you know, in the mirror, and say, yeah, you did that. You know, yeah. Like I told, yeah, you know, I told people I was taking. Um, I took some Six Sigma courses, and I got a yellow belt and a green belt. And uh, I, I, I know someone else who do who did very well in school. I said, you know, I, I, I wasn't for me. To, I, I'd love to have been an A student. I think I was probably B B plus. But it, it, it was more important for me to actually do it, and because I said I was yeah. going to do it, and I did it. Right. You know, I and mean, I uh, absolutely. I mean, accomplishment. And you know, I got you know, when I was a kid, I was you know, I, 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 always, I when I was younger, I would make commitments to people, and I wouldn't follow through. You know, I learned a lot of hard lessons from that. You know, you just can't keep disappointing people in that way. And then I, I learned my lesson and then I, you know, made a complete turnaround on that to say, look, if I, you know, if I tell someone it's going to get done, it's going to get done. And then that's, that's kind of the way I leave my life that I don't like to leave projects unfinished. Um, you know, I, and I, sometimes I overcommit, but, you know, but I, I somehow always get it done. I mean, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, I finally got my pilot's license 15 years ago is because it's something I started when I was in high school and never finished. And that was one of my biggest regrets was never finishing that, you know, getting 70% of the way, you know, this is when I was 17 years old, you know, getting, you know, 70% of the way and not finishing it to me was like, ah, you know, I got to go back and, and, and finish this. And to me, that was, you know, something as a personal accomplishment because, you know, a lot of other things that I've done is, you know, I've always tried to, take on new tasks or, or, or new hobbies. And then I always go into them, you know, a hundred percent, much to the chagrin of those around me, because I don't have like a casual hobby. Like if I want to do something, I do it all in, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't half ass anything. I whole ass it. <laughs> uh, so that answers another question. I was going to say any regrets. And that was your regret right there was yeah. not following through as a younger man. Yeah, um, the regret was that, you know, not, you know, at the, when I was younger, I would, you know, especially high school, college age, you know, I, I did, you know, I would tell people, yeah, you know, I'll meet you for this or let's do this. And then, you know, I would have at the last minute, I would like bail out. I was that person who would be, I, I'm still remembering to this day, there was a time that, you know, the group of people I hung out with, you know, uh, in, in post-college, you know, they had gotten me tickets to see the Grateful Dead. And, you know, I was not a, a fan of the Grateful Dead more because of my own ignorance. You know, I, 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 no one really exposed me to, and I was sort of very closed minded when it came to certain musical genres. So, you know, never really knowing what they were about. I had this pre preconceived notion about what the group was about. And, you know, you know, they got me tickets and I should have went because I regret not seeing them. And that would have been a time that I could have seen them with Jerry Garcia. And, you know, that was just foolish on my part. And that was one of the, I think that's what really opened my eyes to, you know, do it. What If you don't like it, you know what? You, at least you said you tried it. You know, yeah. you, you can't, you don't know until you try it. You know, you can't say you don't like something if you like, you know. Unless you've experienced it, you know, I mean, it was like, you know, skydiving. I, that was one of the things on my bucket list. I wanted to try skydiving. You know, I was all in on this on a few birthdays ago. I don't remember what it was. I think it was my 55th birthday or something like that. You know, went up to Newport, Rhode Island and, you know, booked the skydiving lesson and, you know, did a tandem jump. And there wasn't anything about it I liked. You know, it, it, it wasn't an exciting rush for me. It, I didn't feel any, didn't feel the need to ever do it again. And, you know, it was like, okay, well, I, I could say from experience, I did not enjoy sky, uh, skydiving, you know. But that's another question. That was something you got under your belt. <laughs> I was going to ask, yeah. is there something that you, you always wanted to get under your belt? And, like, you, you did that. So that was one of those yeah. things. Yeah, that was it, you know. And I, when I landed, you know, the, the owner of the skydiving uh, uh, place said to me, because he knew I was a pilot, and he said, you know, um, wasn't, you know, wasn't it great? Do you want to go up again? And I said, you know what? I said, it was good. I mean, I'm glad I did it, but that's the last time that I'll ever jump out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> <laughs> it better be on fire <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I mean, look, people love that. I mean, I had so many people that I knew who absolutely spoke, 
you know, so highly of skydiving. And, um, you know, for me, the joy and being up in the air is, is, you know, piloting a plane. And, you know, I mean, I had such fun this weekend. I, I, I took the plane out yesterday and it was just, you know, puffy cloud day. And I'm just flying in and around the clouds and, you know, dodging them and, you know, just for the sake of flying. And I, and I, I have to say, I am just so fortunate to one to be able to experience this and to get a, a pilot's license because I mean, less than 1% of the population, you know, can fly an airplane. Um, but to be able to have the financial, you know, means behind me to be able to do it, you know, I mean, you know, there are people who spend a lot of money on golf or clothing, you know, I would rather just, you know, take that plane out and uh, enjoy myself in it. It's really cool. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I know from my own experience, just, uh, just doing this, um, uh, I, I am shocked at a number of people who I know who uh, tell me that they've been listening to me. The people of former co-workers and friends are like, right. really? Okay. And uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of flattered about it. But I'm also, uh, I get, I, I, I get scratch my head. I go, oh, yeah, that's right. When I'm get, I get into conversations with people. I'm getting to know them. And I, I'll bring up that I do this. And when I do all, all the scripted ones I do, I, you got to do a little bit of research. You have to be able to know what you're talking about. Right. So I, uh, it's not, not that you're a subject matter expert, but I can actually address something with confidence. And uh, to, to be able to say you've, you can do that uh, where other people just, you know, oh, I don't know. Well, I, as a matter of fact, I do know. Yeah. And, and, and it's just something to say that you can do. It's an achievement. It's an accomplishment. It's something you can do that. And I'm, so I'm more pleased with myself than I thought I would be about this because I was shooting my mouth off a little bit when I first started doing it because I wanted to do something because this is basically the the reason I really wanted to do this was so I could st still have a foothold and keep as toe to toe as I could with with all the other people I was involved with in, in LGBT activism because right. I really wanted to be somebody you know I just can't have a voice and stay uh, current with people because otherwise you know you know, that stuff falls away from you and you don't right you don't of course. Pay connected so uh being able to address that and then have people go oh uh, you know and i had people uh, in the workplace actually come out to me right and uh, that was one of those things i didn't realize that i was uh, because I, just the power of conviction for being comfortable with yourself and your own skin yeah. made other people feel that they could trust you and yeah. because of that, I just kept that going and I didn't want to stop that. So this is why I, the re main reason I, I've done this. But it was also just I want to make sure that I would not give up uh, something that I was uh, I had become um, very uh, comfortable, very, very, very uh, motivated by. I think that was yeah. a thing, you know. So. OK, so what do others not know about you? Hmm, that's a tough question. You know, I think what, uh, you know, I guess a lot of people just don't know that, that I have a, a tremendous creative side. You know, I mean, being a, a business person, you know, they see the, uh, you know, business person, Jerry, you know, but the fact is that, you know, creativity has really driven me throughout my career because a lot of what I used to do in the business was, you um, advertising and marketing and trying to come up with new ways of bringing in customers. And that used to bring me a lot of joy to do that. So, you know, I mean, most of my clients who come in, you know, don't know that about me. So whenever I have a, an opportunity to speak to them and kind of relate to them, I had somebody come in today and, you know, she used to tell me about her writer. She's a writer. And I told her, you know, that I had, a, you know, graduated from school of visual arts and, you know, then we got into a conversation, which is nice. I mean, and, and, and I'm also, you know, I'm a very active listener when it comes to people. I would rather listen to what others have to say than to talk about myself. So I, I, I don't really like to boast about my accomplishments. I mean, being on this podcast with you, I mean, I'm telling things that I would normally not talk about in regular conversation. I'm, I'm kind of shy about telling people that I fly airplanes because I do, they may get the wrong idea about, you know, uh, about me. You know, because that like that, that that immediately, you know, brings a certain you know think that I'm you know have a yacht and you know a mansion you know as the, the old cartoons would say you know he's got a mansion and a yacht, um, you know it's the way I've expressed myself with my hobbies and you know I've got that creative but I I honestly yeah I, I'm I'm a much 
better active listener. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I, I'm not to boast. I don't boast about my accomplishments, especially not in business. You know, I'd rather be humble than anything else. You know, I, I, I you know, even with, with my staff, I, I, I don't talk about, you know, anything that I, that I do because those are typical, typical things to do. You know, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I have great people who work with me and, uh, you know, we have great relationships and, uh, you know, I want to always maintain that with them. So I don't want to, you know, have flaunt things that, you know, maybe they can't, can't have, but I, I try to be the best possible employer that I could be so that I can better the staff who works with us. You know, that's always been a goal of mine to try to, uh, you know, empower people to use working for Jeeves as a springboard to, to do better in their lives. So what should everyone know about you? I think everyone should know is that um, on a personal level that, you know, that I'm incredibly hard working driven person who uh, again, does not give up. Uh, very tenacious about whatever I want to get done. And um, at times, you know, to a fault where I may be a little bit too driven when it comes to speaking to staff or getting things done. In fact, maybe I expect a little too much about myself and push myself a little bit too hard at times. But, you know, you know, it's going to get done. Like I said earlier in the conversation, you know, um, if, if, if you trust me to do something for you, it's going to get done and it's going to get to, get done to the best of our ability and then some. Okay, so um, is there anything you struggle with you wish you did not? I mean, like my daughter, Alex, you know, I do struggle with, you know, bouts of depression and anxiety, which, you know, uh, you know, been working through for a long time, you know, I didn't have a great upbringing as a, as a, a child, which I think has affected me throughout my life. Um, you know, more recently with the struggles of going through the pandemic, uh, it was very difficult on me emotionally and mentally. You know, there was times that, you know, seeing a psychiatrist to try medications, which never really worked for me. I never found that the, the perfect combination. And I also didn't like the way the meds made me feel. And I didn't want to, you know, and that also meant that I had to stop flying, you know, flying oh, the yeah. plane if I was going to take antidepressants or whatever. So, you know, uh, mental illness is something that I really feel that us as a country should really have a better understanding of and more empathy towards people who struggle with it. Uh, I think that, again, like I said earlier, with going through what we went through with Alex, um, you know, you tell somebody you're depressed, they're like, well, just snap out of it, you know, you know, you know, that's, that's the normal, you know, I mean, especially, you know, if I ever told my father when he was alive, you know, I was feeling depressed, he's like, what the, what the F is wrong with you? You know, you know, you've got all these things, why are you depressed? You know, you know, you didn't live through the depression, why are you depressed? <laughs> uh I always liken it to uh, the, the thing with standing desks. Um, yeah. How many people, you know, it became the thing that it, it, you had to have a standing desk. Right. And I said, if you try to explain, it, try to explain this to your grandfather. You know, and I always say, you know how many people worked on their feet their entire life so they could get a job and they could sit down behind a desk. And they look at you like, you, you want to stand now? But you they just stand? Didn't stand. <laughs> but uh, I, I, you'd be surprised at um, how many of the people I've interviewed all have uh, spoken about their struggles with depression. Yeah. So many. I mean, I mean you know, the vast majority of people. Yeah, it's tough. It's a tough thing. I mean, you know, we, you know, living in New York City, um, you know, uh, working with, uh, uh, I, you know, I, our client is the one percent. You know, uh, you know, uh, uh, at times, you know, again, it's a difficult client base. You know, one service industry. We're we're in the service industry. We're dealing with the ultra wealthy. We're dealing with people who, you know, no is not using an option for them. So you're trying to come up with creative solutions to get what to what they want. And sometimes, you know, I've got, I would say the vast majority of the people that I work with, my clients are amazing, beautiful, nice, warm people that I would move mountains for. 
But then you get those people who are like, you know, you never want to speak to again, ever. And, you know, and there are times that we've actually fired clients. You know, I've actually told people, look, you know, no matter what we seem to do, we don't seem to be able to fulfill your needs as, you know, to keep your wardrobes looking amazing. So I really think it's time for you to move on to a different cleaner. I got to tell you, when you tell them that, I had this woman, she was like begging me to, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, I, 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 she goes, I won't, I won't talk to you that way anymore. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. I, I said, you know, you just even saying that, you know, that you were not treating. And, I, and it was more my, it was more our staff than me. You know, I mean, I, I don't, don't go for that, but, but putting all those pressures on you, you know, the pressure of running a small business, the pressure of being responsible for the 18 people or 19 people that work under you and knowing that, you know, you know, you keeping the business running and profitable means that all these other people are going to be able to do, to do what they need to do in their lives and dealing with clients and dealing with other, uh, everything else. It's just, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot, you know, and I sometimes I get envious of those people who, you know, sometimes I wish I was doing a job where, you know what, I was sitting in a room and, you know, bring me a, a, a you know, a handbag and you give me a day to, to restore it and, you know, and leave me alone. You know, I'd be so happy sometimes just to do to, to give a service at that level, whereas, you know, I am responsible, totally responsible for all parts of it, because then you know, I'm not going to have clients who are disappointed because maybe a staff member made a mistake or a driver got there late. You know, it's like, I know I could, I could go from beginning to end and, and give somebody something exemplary. That would be sometimes be, you know, my dream be just like to shut everybody else out. Like there's a saying in small business, you know, you know, small business is great, except we have to deal with people. So Yeah. yeah. I used to say that I was the one elf for many cobblers. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I would. That's what my job. And and when I worked in restaurants, you know, um, I always told everybody I worked with that people worked for me. Ninety five percent of people are great. It's those five percent of people who color and ruin your evening, and you won't. And it's hard to shake that off. And that's what makes it people is. go out and do self destructive things to themselves because they no. have the, their self esteem is just battered. No, I you agree. Know? I mean, you know, I've been bow I've been, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, spoken to like a child by so many like people from time to time. And look, and I'm, you know, I'm 60 years old. I mean, don't talk to me this way. You want to talk to me like an adult? Look, we made if we made a mistake or I'm trying to solve a problem, it's going to get solved. You know, I mean, you know, you don't need to to lecture me. You know, when, when they start lecturing me, that's when I, I just can't take it anymore. You know, when they, they put that tone of voice, well, you know, you know, I'm spending a lot of money and, you know, I don't expect my bag to be stapled. It should have been closed with safety pins. But, you know, it's like, okay, fine. I get it. You know, look, I understand. Yes, our clients do spend a lot of money. And, you know, there are times that, yes, they were, we do make mistakes. And, you know, what? and I, again, like I said earlier, say to me, hey, Jerry, look, I'm disappointed. It came to me this way. You know, it's hard for me to open the bag with staples, you know, it's, and I was like, absolutely, you're 100% right. You know what, it won't happen again. You know, that's, this order's on me. I'm comping you the order, you know, but don't talk down to me. Mm. And that's, that's, that's what, that's what really brings on the depression and the anxieties because I don't have a super thick skin. So I let those things creep into my psyche and I bring those things home. I'm like, I can't just let it roll off my back. You know, I've gotten much better at it, but you know, that's, that's my downfall. I mean, I've literally t spoken to leadership consultants uh, mm -hmm. who, uh, who, who authors of books. I've, I've interviewed a number of people who are authors of books. And one of the people I've recently, and most recently interviewed was somebody I used to work with as a tech writer and okay. he's written a number of novels and a, few, a number of screenplays. And he talked about his lifelong struggle dealing with his mother's depression. Uh, other right. people trans transsexual, you know, uh, dealing with uh, the, the self-esteem issues and the torrent of uh, emotion that goes in when you start taking the, uh, the drugs. This is chemicals whirling around in your brain and you're, right. you know, it makes you uh, it 
feel all these different things. Um, a load of people who uh, I, I've spoken to who have uh, been performers and have different stories to tell. Uh, I think people, when they put themselves out there, they you know you stick your, you stick your neck out. There's a good chance someone's going to try and chop it off. Yeah. So you you but you have to do that. There's something there's a there's a compulsion to do that, and then that means you're on a roller coaster uh, uh, quite often, and uh, you don't know where it's going to land. So they have to deal with those things and reconcile those emotions by themselves because nobody gives them a roadmap. Right, and it's exactly. very very difficult. It is, it is. But you know, there's a lot of great health care professionals out there. You know, there's a lot of great ones. There's a lot of ones that aren't so good either. You know, it's a it's a it's a hard thing to navigate sometimes. But it's just it's really hard to find and uh you know I'm, I'm thankful you know i found a few good people over the years and you know it's helped me dramatically um and you have to mesh with them too you know you have to mesh with them but you also have like i said to the last therapist that i had was like i said i told her i said i really want you to push me i don't want to just sit here and just talk about stuff yeah you know i want you to push me to be uncomfortable so that I can get through these things. And, you know, it's, I don't want to just, you know, sit here and, and, and vent for 45 minutes about how miserable things are in my life, because, you know, they're, they're not on a lot of cases, but let's get to the root cause of what's, 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 what's causing the depression. But I do have to say that the exercise has helped dramatically with that, you know, doing hard cardio and pushing myself to exercise seven days a week has really been uh, something which has been extraordinarily helpful, but I Sorry, do need Jonathan. to, yeah, I do need to also, you know, take some more time for myself because I do, I'm too driven at times. Okay, so I'm going to be a couple more questions. Okay. All right. Uh, what do you want to be better at? I want to be better at, um, <clears throat> I want to be better at, at, that being a better husband with my wife, because there are times that I just, you know, I miss the cues of what I'm supposed to be doing, or I miss the cues of what she's telling me, you know, I mean, everyone talks about love language and all that. Um, you know, she speaks a completely different language when it comes to our relationship than I do. And, you know, over the years, you know, it's been, you know, you go through those phases in marriage or when any, with any significant others, you know, you've got the honeymoon phase. And then when we had children right away, you know, then we raised the kids, you know, empty nesters. And, you know, at this point, you know, we've, we're rediscovering who we both are as people, but I need to be a better, I, I need to do better when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, you know, responding to what she needs, you know, I kind of think about what I need, but I forget about what she needs. So that's what I would like to improve. Okay, and uh, let's say, what's your strongest priority? My strongest priority right now, <laughs> business or, or personal? Whatever you want to answer, however you want to answer. The priority right now is that we're rebuilding a new retail store. So my priority right now is getting this retail store built so we can move. Uh, we've been at the same location here on 65th Street for over 30 years. You know, pandemic has you know opened up a lot of retail opportunities. So my priority right now is to get that built. But on a personal level, my priority is to my son Zach has come into the business three years ago. So I mean, I really want to give him all of the tools to be able to successfully run this business. So I could slowly start to make an exit over the next five or six years where I can do something else. You know, I really would like to, um, I don't want to retire to nothing. You know, I saw what happened to my dad when he stopped working. He kind of retired to sitting in a chair watching television and, you know, he didn't last very long. You know, from going from like 90 miles an hour to nothing is not a good thing. And also he didn't have many hobbies. So, I mean, I've got lots of interests and as long as I'm physically able to do things, I'm going to do them. And I'm, as long as I'm physically able to get up in the morning and do some kind of work, you know, I'm going to do it. So would it be nice to slowly get out of the dry cleaning business, make sure Zach has the tools to run the company successfully so he can bring the company to the next level, which is what I want him to do. I want him to be wildly successful. Um, so that maybe I could just do something that is a, a happy business, you know, something where it's not as intense with dealing with people's wardrobes that are fantastically expensive, you know, you know, maybe a small uh, cheese and charcuterie store would be great. You know, you know, I love food. 
I wouldn't want to do anything to do with the restaurant business, but you know, something that would be nice. Yeah, I um, I tell people things that I like to do, and um, I think people conflate uh, uh, what you like to do with what they perceive. That and I, I don't I don't want to work like a fishwife. I want to do what I do as efficiently and as yeah. as productively as possible to get the most rewarding uh, experience. But I I don't think they understand that. They think and they think that everything gets thrown in the mix. So, no, not really. You yeah. like to do something selectively, but yeah, let's um, do something selectively where it's. A, I said I call it a happy business. You know, something where people are coming into a store and they're buying something because they're it's for a happy occasion. You know, they're having guests over, they're having family, or they love cheese, or they you know they want some wonderful prosciutto de Parma, and you have it, and you know, and you have a lot of knowledge to impart. I mean, I love to educate people about anything. So to me, you know, when someone comes in and asks questions about how to take care of a garment. That's my favorite thing to do when I come to work. You know, someone just wants to pick my brain about doing this for 34 years. That to me is where I shine. It's like, okay, yeah, you've got this. Let me look at this. Let's analyze it. Let's let's figure it out. Let's see, is this doable? Can we fix this for you? You know, you know, giving advice to me is the most enjoyable part of the business. So if I was able to do that in another kind of business, I would love to do that. Okay, so I got three. Questions now will be the end. Okay. Okay. What's your favorite weather? Favorite weather time of the year is either spring or fall when the weather is moderate. I'm not a big fan of extreme heat or extreme cold. In fact, I can really do three seasons more than the fourth season. I can deal with the heat of the summer. Winter is not good for me. I mean, I, I mean, I don't like the heat of summer, but I can I can manage through it. But my favorite day would be like this past weekend. It was. I don't know, 65, 60 degrees, whatever it was, crisp outside, it felt good, you know, lightweight jacket, the same thing in spring, you know, lightweight jacket, weather, you know, um, more than the, the extremes, you know, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of snow at all. Yeah, um, I always say I can live between 39 and 63 and I would be happy. <laughs> um, now, uh, and another, another easy, good, hopefully this is an easy one. What's your favorite color? And my favorite color is uh, red. And why? Why is that your favorite color? I don't. I, I think it goes back to when I was a kid. I had a, a red telephone. You know, when when people actually had telephones, it was a big deal. I had an actual telephone in my room. You know, we had the house phone in the kitchen, and my yeah. parents got me a phone. It was red. I think I had a red wall. I've owned a bunch of red cars. Um, my airplane is red and white, and I didn't have a choice. I mean, I just think I gravitate towards any bright color. I mean, I've had a lot of fun cars that have been bright colors. I, I tend to, you know, want that car or color that's unusual as opposed to, you know, uh, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, I don't really, you know, I do own a gray suit, but of course my tie collection is rather, rather colorful. So something that would definitely be a little shouty on the, on the spectrum when it came to colors, but yeah, I would, I would go to, to, to red. So I guess this would be the best way to follow up and end. <clears throat> what is your most treasured possession? Wow. That's a, that's a tough one. My most treasured possession. You know, I'm not, I don't have a lot of things. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I actually, lean towards minimalism than than that so you know treasured possession could be it, it, it's something that could be uh, change changeable i mean i've got a couple of cameras that i absolutely love i don't really have a treasured possession i don't have something that i would say you know if this was missing from my life you know i would be uh, uh you know you know i i would be you know uh without we're talking about a physical possession a physical something right an object Yes, yes. Yeah. As an object, it is nothing that I would, you know, if, if I didn't have it tomorrow that I would, you know, be heartbroken. I, I've tried to, I've tried to get, I've gotten away from like, like saying this is the end all to be all on something, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I love my airplane, you know, uh, uh, you know, at times I had a couple of vintage cars that were treasured possessions, but, you know, things change, circumstances change, you know, I mean, I think treasure is 
possessions are more that relationships that I have with people than anything else, because those things would be, those are impossible to, to replace. So, you know, I have a lifelong friend who I've known from college is probably, you know, that's one person who I've, who knows me better than anyone else. You know, uh, my wife, uh, second, mo you know, know me longer than the, than my, my high school and you know, my college friend, you know, I mean, those are more, treasure to me than any sort of object you know i mean objects can be replaced so i'm going to end like as i always do i say great. thank you so much for your great the great time great experience talking with you uh, and um uh thanks for listening see you next time and as the kitties say peace out thanks tim it was a pleasure uh, was talking to you today